Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm not going to do uh, an Apple and, and yell developers at you, but uh, this is the developer meetup. So welcome. Uh, we have a lot of people joining online as well. Um, so we'll be able to take some questions. We have, uh, this was added a little bit last minute to the um, agenda. So it's, um, yeah, we've got a number of, of uh, rapid fire uh, in-person presentations that I think will be really interesting to talk a little bit about what the HISP Center team, the uh, DHS2 core team uh, is doing, as well as we'll have the, the finalists from the app competition talking about some of the challenges that they uh, encountered in developing their applications. And we'll talk through that as well. Um, but this is also the, the typical slot for our monthly developer meetup. So if you're not joining those already, please feel free to join them. We will go ahead and, and, and kick it off with our first presenter who is it? Uh, yeah, is Victor? Okay. Yeah, so Victor's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, what's been going on on the Android side for developers, um, and particularly uh, just talking about what that what the Android team is working on. Uh, Victor has led the Android SDK team for four years, six years, six years. Yeah, so a little while. Uh, so he knows what he's talking about. I promise. All right, passing it off to Victor. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Victor. I'm in the Android team, and I'm going to present uh, the more or less the current status, like a very high level overview of the Android team, what we are doing. I don't want to use uh, so much time because there is uh, yeah a number of presentations, short presentations today. So uh, what I want to explain is. Uh, how it's evolving the two main products in the in the Android team, the capture app at the SDK, how is the current status? And I think it's interesting because uh, there have been I I had been I have had several conversations with some of you that we were wondering where the SDK and the capture app are going to. Uh, what is coming next? Very quickly, and there finally a cross-platform initiative. It's not. Yes, Android specific. Yes, uh, something that is uh, happening. All right. So how it's evolving. Uh, so one thing to mention about the capture app is not functional. It's not about uh, how it looks like. It's more about the code of the capture app. In case you have any fork out there or you have any yeah customization on top, and I know you do. Uh, so one of the main things are happening in the capture app is the translation from Java. The, all Java code to Kotlin, the recommending the recommended uh, language from Google. So this is this has been happening a while ago, like three, four years ago, it started, and is continuing. And also another major change is the uh, migration from the old XML views to Compose components. If you don't know Compose components, they are closer to React components, conceptually speaking. And it gives a lot of flexibility and, yeah, and safety and code. So just as a heads up, uh, careful with your forks in case you have it, you have them, uh, because uh, some changes in the code are happening. Uh, but the SDK is similar. I mean, we are moving from Java to Kotlin as well. Uh, maybe this is not so important for you because it is not so common to fork the SDK itself. I mean, you are users of the SDK. But uh, this change may impact in the API of the SDK in some ways. And this is like a, the most typical change that you will notice when consuming the SDK because uh, this is not a change, a like a real change in the API. The API is exactly the same. The API is posed by DSDK. But uh, we have this old Java method returning an event. This is just an example. You know, in Java, the nullability is not explicitly defined. I mean, you can use annotations and all that. But by default, this can be null or not null. So in your app, you can do something like that, right? Now, in the SDK, is Kotlin, so the nullability is explicitly defined. So in case you want to fetch an event and the result can be null, 
the the compiler will give you we throw an error a compile time saying okay take care of the possible null value here and you will have to take care of that so it's not a break it sense that itself but it could make your compile to break but it's for the best i guess <laughs> Yes, I mean, well, what is preventing this is from a potential null pointer. Yeah, so yeah, it's for the best, I guess. So it's showing potential null pointers out of there. Um, so this is new, uh, this is coming. Um, you know, if you remember in the what's new in the first day, the mobile the capture app has a very new ui right so all those ui components are separated in a ui library that will be published uh, at some point uh, not farther from now and so it will be an external library is dhs2 oriented in the sense that we will include like or unit 3 things like that but it's not dhs2 specific i mean there is not a dependency to the SS2. You can use it for anything you want. And it's built on Compose multi-platform. Uh, it's uh, like a, a variant of Compose, of Jetpack Compose. Uh, now we are targeting only Android, but potentially this library could be used in iOS, for example. So that's quite it. And it's, a, it's actually it's in our roadmap to make it available for iOS. Uh, this is similar. This is something that we want to release as well. It's, uh, it's similar to the UI library, but uh, more elaborated. It's like uh, to have the, the whole form, including the interaction with the SDK and including the, implement the integration with the, with the rule engine. So for example, you can just provide the, the program, uh, maybe the TI, and you will have a, a whole component rendering all the inputs with all the logic of the rule engine. So this is something we are thinking about. And uh, we could yeah, bundle it in a separate library as well. So we are trying to extract components from the capture app to make it individual. And so you can use them in your own apps. And the last thing I want to mention uh, is the is this, this is not specific to the mobile uh, team. It's a cross platform initiative uh, about the expression parser and the rule engine. So the problem I think is is well known by all of you. I mean, now there are uh, two main uh, rule engines, one in JavaScript and another one in Java. The one in Java is used by the backend and Android, right? Um, so having two different rule engines, uh, could potentially, I mean, we know the cases, they are well known, they are not surprising, but in some cases, uh, the results could be uh, different, especially when dealing with uh, Boolean values and uh, numbers. Uh, those cases are well known, um, <clears throat> but it still uh, leads to confusion in the community that why this prom rule is behaving this way in the web and why it's behaving differently in Android. So, and also, uh, Another consequence of having two engines is duplicated development and maintenance work, right? So the idea is to have uh, a single rule engine written in Kotlin multi-platform that ca can compile to JavaScript and Java. So uh, there will be a still a JavaScript library and a Java library, but the source code will be unified. So the respective behavior will be the same for both engines. And that will be in, yeah, in Goldin multi-platform. And hopefully that will become uh, yeah, published at some point. And yep, yeah, I was I wanted to be quick and that's pretty much so, yeah. Hey, thanks so much. Um, 
with regards to the single rule engine and in Kotlin, just curious of the timeline that you're working backwards from for that. And also, it sounds like that's a new rule engine for both for both platforms. And I don't know, not knowing anything about it, if Kotlin or just in general, that would allow for a process of like a brainstorming session about rule engines in general, if that if that time is right now, or if it's like, it's really focused on making what is available into a single source and then pushed out. I'm not sure if that makes sense. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, the evolution, what do we are, our plan? Uh, because, you know, calling and Java at interoperable. So it's quite easy to translate a Java library into Kotlin. And from then quite easy to move to Kotlin multi-platform. You just have to get rid of, of the Java dependencies. So the plan is to use the, the rule engine that we have for Java, translate it into Kotlin, and make it available for, Java, for JavaScript as well. And yeah, and the progress is quite advanced, advanced at this point. This is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. <laughs> okay. Uh, I see that I have a question regarding on uh, program rules engine. Okay. Uh, rules engine. Um, uh, I would like to know that uh, this this library, uh. Is there some function that will work uh, in the server side or in the backend? Because, you know, uh, we have uh, some program rules that uh, will change, for example, in another stage or in another event or in another stage. And uh, if I uh, have uh, some tracker that uh, have a lot of events and uh, for performance, in my application, I don't want to uh, fetch all the data to change and post them uh, using this program rule program rule engine. Uh, because of that, I would like to know if uh, is there some function that will work uh, in this like like uh, server side or or like uh, uh, mm. there's some function that this library will. Uh, connected uh, with the API to do the pull, uh, the 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 changes with in this in this track and the test. I don't know that you get my question. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks. I... Do you want to answer? Oh yeah. Well, so far the rule engine is only responsible for the evaluation of the rules and like returning on some actions. So it is the client, your app or the backend, who is responsible to apply those actions. So it's not part of the rule engine itself. It's only the evaluation. And you, you give all the information to the rule engine and the rule engine returns the, uh, the actions to take place. So it's, okay. It means that, uh, for example, if uh, I have uh, some program rule that will change in another stage, I need to fetch the all the data and and uh, pass to the to the rule engine. Is it? Yeah, that's it. Okay, I don't know how much time we have because there's... yeah, I, th I think we can we can wrap up. I did have one, just one addition, I think, to your last point. So there will be some behavior change in one or one of the rule engine behaviors, right? I think that's something people will need to be aware of that, for yeah. example, in this, if you were expecting this to be false in the, in the browser, for example, or in, in Java, yeah, yeah. then it will be true now. Um, so I think that's something we'll need to document and, and share. Yeah. The good thing is that in Android, we have identified most of the cases where they differ. So I think it should be quite easy to, to know the difference, the new behavior. Great. I think we can probably move on to to the next presentation, but Vic, Victor's around if if uh, people have questions after. Maybe we'll have some time at the end for questions as well. Thank you, Victor.
Thank you. I think next up we had uh, actually some presentations from the finalists for the app competition. Um, Renee, are you online? Do you do you have a an order that you had in mind? Uh, yeah, I I'm online. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, cool. Um, so I didn't have an order in mind. Uh, I know there's there's at least one person in person there, uh, and I know there's at least one person online. I am missing a third. Uh, Abu Mir, I don't know if you're online or in person, but um, uh, but I th I think we can start in person maybe. Um, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, Abu Mir is here in person as well. Okay, that's great. Yeah. So, do you want to go first? <laughs> sure. So we we asked uh, Rene. Do you want to introduce kind of what the what the the task was or the the, the request was from the, the each of the finalists and what we're gonna do? Sure, Renee is sure. our, our developer advocate, by the way, so he can introduce himself as well. <laughs> Hi. So um, for those who don't know me, um, I am a Renee. I'm a developer advocate, and I've been um, guiding the, um, the the competition here. Um, and so the competition was a challenge that we're doing every year where developers are sending in their application they've been building, which then gets um, uh, we we check for a couple uh, conditions that we've, we've set, like for quality and reusability. And so the apps are all intended for everyone, uh, for as many installations as possible. Um, and so I've asked them to to share a couple challenges they faced um, um, to present to you to see like to, that you can learn also from them and what they are encountering. Um, but I also want to say you can still vote. The votes are still open, so if uh, uh, if you haven't voted yet, uh, you can do so still. Um, but I'll 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 hand it over to you guys, and then uh, uh, I will be back later with some more fun things. Great, thanks, Renee. Go ahead and uh, introduce yourself, and and uh, and we'll go from there. Thank you very much. Uh, is my voice loud enough? Oh, cool. So my name is Abu Mary. I work with um, FHI three hundred and sixty. So we we submitted one of our uh, one of our applications made the the final final um, list uh, from Forge, and um, I don't have a presentation slide here because this is just um, uh, we're just informed suddenly just to have this um, talk. So um, I've been told to talk about the challenge around um, the DHIS two version testing uh, challenge that we had. Uh, so I'll just take us through a little bit of the testing process and how we still uh, came around uh, resolving what we faced. Uh, so the, we, we have a, we're a very small team, actually. We're just a team of two, actually, and quite a young team. And uh, we work with the EPIC team to, to address some of their data collection and um, challenges, and also around setting up... Um, automated processes as much as possible to to optimize their processes. So uh, we came up with the idea of solving this problem that has been on for a very long time. So when um, the normal MER tools have been updated, the process of, um, of, of updating the custom data sets and setting up new ones is quite challenging and also error prone. So we came up with this solution and just to address this so that going forward, these all yearly challenges are resolved. So um, we had a functional testing approach to address the, bus the business uh, needs, which we worked in hand with the program team to ensure that um, all the functionalities that they needed, you know, was met. So, so the non-functional part again, what we're talking about, like optimizing the process, ensuring the errors are caught as much as possible, and you know, go through this with my with my team. Like I said, we're just a team of two. So I'm just going straight to the DHIS two version testing challenge. While we went through this process, I think it was fine, at least where we passed, went through and checked all the the box boxes. When we deployed to production, and uh, during in the testing environment, everything was fine. We now went to production, and suddenly I got a feedback that 
in the production, it was filling. It wasn't um, running. I looked through and I found out that the, the behavior which I didn't catch was this, that in the production, which strangely I went to the play instance, it was fine there, the same version. So, I, so, so I, what I just did, the production was, when we pulled from the data store, it was returning a net, nested object. But when you pull from other versions, it wasn't. So um, that is something that I, when I, I went online to look to the community, I didn't even find any, see that anybody has experienced this particular challenge. I went online looking for within the DHIS community. So we set up, the source code is online, so um, it's getting published. So we set up a function just to, um, to would I use the right, the, uh, the right word, to just uh, normalize it in a way that the uh, the the um, when it returns the object from the the use data query hook, we set up a function, a, log a logic, just to to sort out that part. So if it is if it is straight an object that is nested, it's it's it um it uh, uh addresses that, else it goes normally. So what we intend to do going forward is to um set up a. a, a uh, uh, a special a special class to address this particular uh, logic to constantly check um, based on the version. So it was it wasn't easy to spot that at the first time because we did all we had to do. We went to the play instance, did that, but it performed properly. However, it still failed when we went to production. So I'm not really sure why that happened, but that's my experience. Like I said, the challenge that was, that we that we faced. So the function is the, the source code is online. Please, can I also campaign for them to check and vote? Please vote for Funforge. <laughs> <laughs> I'll allow it. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, thank you for thank you for sharing that challenge. I don't know if, uh, especially any of the developers in the in, in the audience, if you have uh, thoughts on. Uh, what, I, I don't know what the the bug might be or the issue might be why why it's returning uh, nested in some cases and not others. It's something we should, probably should look into. We should create a jury issue and and look into that. Uh, but I did also want to mention that what you what you experienced is is kind of a microcosm of what we call version toggling. So you ha if you have different behavior in different versions of DHS two, and you have an application that needs to support multiple versions, you need to have some way to determine like basically which version you're talking to and and change the behavior of your application based on that. Either so maybe certain parts of your application should be hidden. Maybe yeah. maybe you need to interact with the API in a different way. And so this is something that we do quite a bit in our uh, core applications, but we also need to think about how we can maybe facilitate everybody to do this in a, in a consistent way. Um, anybody else want to add to that? Yeah. Uh, so on the data store problem, I'm not sure about their bug, but I think it highlights how important it is when you're working with the data store in particular, because it's just a... Uh, it's just a JSON store. You can store anything. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's really important when you work with this, and I made some examples, and I tried to highlight how important it is to validate whatever you put in and whenever you read it and handle that gracefully. So like we, do, we use it in the maintenance store and in the new maintenance app and in the old one. But there we have like these schemas to validate what you get back is actually what you want. And if you don't get it back, you either like if you cannot handle it, you would throw an error. But most of the time you can have some default data you can either put in and replace or just handle there gracefully, right? So it's, when you work with this, it's really important to have a have validation with it. But of course, sometimes there's some data you have there that you you have to have and yeah. But but it's a it's a struggle and it's probably something we could document more. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Great, thank you. Any uh, any other comments or questions to this this particular challenge? Has anybody else experienced something similar before? I have. Okay, yeah, so I'm not alone. <laughs> All right, then. Thank, Thank you very so much. much. Uh, I'm going to say this after each of the finalists, so it's not favoritism. Vote for Formforge. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, next up, let's go. Actually, let's go online. So I think, uh, who do we have online for the finalists? Um, we have Rajiv, uh, but I don't know oh, if yeah. you're in. I I made them a co-host, so can you unmute yourself and get let yourself down? Roger, are you not here? Do you want to? Do you want to? Oh, is there? You like to, <laughs> would you like to present in person? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good.
He was just pretending to be online. Ah, uh, uh, okay, okay. I can just pretend. Okay, I'm online. Okay, so I'm I'm Rajab from University of Dar es Salaam. So uh, one of our app, which is a metadata assignment, uh, made in the finalist, finally. So I, I just want to present a little bit of what is it exactly. <laughs> and uh, it's because of, we are currently supporting the HMIS in Tanzania and we are responsible for sort of all those maintenance aspects, including assignments. So uh, it becomes a challenge for us to really focusing on development and assignment. So we sort of created that to simplify the process and also decentralize to, 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 to district user. So uh, the application actually was created six years ago. Yeah, and we are currently angle, angle agnostic uh, kind of team. <laughs> yeah, so by then the application was running. We didn't know if it was being used around the community until 2023 when someone within the community of practice actually highlighted it not working in the uh, 40, uh, version 40. So now we got back to, to try and more of updating, uh, you know, the six years uh, lag kind of thing. So we found ourselves having dependence, most of the dependency deprecated. So we try to more like update to, to latest versions. So we are using Angular, at least Angular has uh, that incremental step towards upgrade kind of migration aspect of up upgrading to the uh, newest version. So we did upgrade to six, uh, Angular 6 to 17. Now the <laughs> challenge there came around uh, before uh, the, you know, before the app platform, uh, the components are where we are really dictated by Innovator themselves. So we had our own uh, thinking around our unit component, our own thinking ar 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 around tables and something like that. But now we have to develop something that fits well with, you know, the, 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 the DHS2 ecosystem and design system. So that's where when we had to now think around use the DHS to UA components, the app platform components. And as I said, we are Angular kind of, <laughs> and our team is really limited towards learning React and something like that. So we were trying to look on how we can resolve that situation and challenge. So towards the ex extensibility kind of idea, the idea of having plugins. So we also thought ourselves if we can think about having wrappers, a kind of similar of plugin idea. So we can still uh, use our preferred uh, or use the technology choice, but also uh, seamlessly incorporate some of the UI components that are being developed within the, the UIO core team. So we managed that luckily and of, uh, now built a uh, sort of a wrapper uh, that wraps in the uh, Kai's libraries. <laughs> and we can now, we are able now to run uh, the org unit components, the buttons, the menu, that app shell, everything within the Angular, which underneath the users react uh, components. So, uh, that's all for me. I wanted to share that detail uh, to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. I know that you, you mentioned uh, a couple challenges. Maybe one of them is like service worker, for example. Angular has its own idea of service worker, which is maybe a little bit in conflict with the one in the platform. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's very cool to see what you guys have done with uh, basically you can use a React UI component in an Angular application, yeah. um, and so you can re you can have you can leverage what the the community is doing, what what we're doing at the core team um, in an Angular application. I think that's something that you've you've published as well. So if other people are are developing in Angular, they could also yes. use this. Yes, yeah, definitely. We we have some libraries, yeah, uh, yeah, and uh, the workspace called the iApps. You will find uh, what we call ng dhs two shell. Actually, that if you you your Angular developer when you run it. It actually will give you that menu component and you can still continue developing everything as with Angular. Also, we have uh, the NGDHS2 UI, which actually wraps all those uh, components around the DHS2 ecosystem. We have a couple of them. If you go to iApps, you will actually find them. So that is why we are, that, that's what we have tried to do around the community. Thank you.
Great, thank you. Does anyone want to comment or, or have questions for Rajiv? No? Great, thank you. I have to say it. Vote for metadata assignment. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Rajiv. And next, I think we have ICT. So it's, yeah, great. Okay, great. Okay, starting again. So I'm Adrian from ICT and I wanted to show you the challenges that we have with Metadata Sync. So first, I guess most of you know what the application is about, but just like in two minutes, so the application is basically facilitating the synchronization of data and metadata uh, between different DHIS systems. And the other thing that is not so famous is that it can also create like metadata package and publish that packages into GitHub, and then you can download and import in different instances. So this is the typical layout that we are used to in metadata sync. Uh, super simple, first line is about aggregated data, synchronization data. Uh, second line is about event and tracker data. Third line is about synchronizing the metadata. If we see this in columns, the first one is about manual synchronization, so things that you need to synchronize once and, and you don't need to do it again. The second column is something that we call synchronization rules, that basically is something that you need to do every now and then. For example, you have a pre-production environment and you need to synchronize every Monday everything to production. This You create a synchronization rule and you schedule it for every Monday. Uh, and the last one is history. Okay, so in here you have like everything that has been executed and you can see if it was a success or a failure. And the last two lines that we have is, this is the line about creating, publishing and managing packages. And this one that I wanted to show you because there is a challenge related to this one is about the instance. In here you define like your target distance. That means where you are going to be pushing the data, the metadata, or where you are going to be pulling. And also in here you create the mapping because sometimes like the metadata is not identical. So you can create like a map basically saying this data element is actually this other data element in the target distance. So this is all in terms of technology. We are aligned with uh, what DHIS is in terms of like the graphical component and so on, so React.js. The only difference is TypeScript. We are, have been using TypeScript for many years. It's particularly useful for us. It's something related to what Birk was saying. We use TypeScript because it helps us identify like bugs and error when things are not matching. We have, we have also the schemas for the API, so it's really useful for us. And now the technical challenges, okay? So I basically want to talk about two things, uh, the data store and the builds. Okay, so uh, all this that I'm saying needs to be a store somewhere and it cannot fit into the regular DHIS data model. So everything is stored in, in the data store. Okay, so uh, the data store somehow is our database basically. So one of the problems that we have at the beginning because metadata has been around for the last six versions to 30 is the partial updates. Now we can do partial updates in the data store but before we couldn't do it. So what we have to do is to get the data store, maybe change one key and then push all the information back. And this every time that the user click on save. So this means like five megabytes that you need to download, five megabytes that you need to upload. Everything was too slow. So our intention was to build something like this, like six keys. But the problem about this is that every time you need to change something, you need to download everything. So the idea, for example, one of these keys is the history. So the idea was to have a key with history and one record inside, like nested. 
this was too painful for the user. So every save was like 20 seconds waiting. So what we, did, what we did was kind of a flatten. So we flattened the structure and this is what we had right now. So for example, in the history, instead of having a record inside, what we have is like two records at the root level. So that way we can do like a partial update, which was like kind of a workaround to do a partial update. So this is one of the challenge that we have. Another one is like you are managing different DHI assistances. So we have to play around with the sharing setting of the data store. It's something that you cannot do from the graphical interface in Find Not Wrong, but it's accessible from the API. So we make it accessible from the graphical interface of Metadata Sync and it's working fine. The API is quite nice and this is what we are using mainly for security purposes. And the last one is related to the first one. Okay, so we have something that we call migration that is similar to migration in Android and it's also similar to the DHIS migration. So if you go from DHIS to 36 to DHIS 40, for example, there are some migrations that are executed with Flyway, that is the technology. And this migration, what they do is that they prepare the database for you. For example, if there is a new field in the data mail, in the data element, this is going to be a new column in the data element table. This is happening with migration. So we have something like that because actually the data store is our database, so we sometimes need to change it. For example, we have a flatten model in the data store, and now partial updates are allowed. So what we are going to do is implement a migration that make this actually a, a proper hierarchy structure. Okay, so what happened is like when you log in into the application, when uh, the application realized that it's not actually the same version, the application and the data store, this happens. So it tells you, okay, you are in version zero. Actually, this needs to be in version 11. So I'm going to apply all this and this change the application. This is a module that we are using like in some other application. This is about data store. The other thing that I want to tell you is about the build. So I'm talking all the time about Metadata Sync being a, a DHIS app, but it's a little bit more. It's like with the same source code, you can have like different applications, but also scripts and also widgets in the dashboard. So uh, this is all that you can do with the same source code and it can change a lot. So this is what I showed you at the beginning. That is the regular build. But then we also have like custom builds. This, for example, something that we did for Samaritan's Purse. This is an emergency field hospital. So the idea is that basically uh, they set up a DHIS in a laptop. They take the laptop with them to, and it's, it actually happened to Ukraine or to Turkey, to the earthquake. They take all the data and the interface is super simple to bottom, one button to get the metadata, one button to push the data. So it's like we are isolating the user of all the complexity and just generating like a very simple layout. This was a little bit challenging because obviously we need to have in the package.json different builds and all the builds need to be sharing the same data store because we don't want like the synchronization rule need to be shared by all of them. So this was a tricky part and they, we need to generate a different manifest for each of them and so on. This is another build for MSF that is currently working on South Sudan that is basically synchronizing uh, data from program indicator from tracker into aggregated, one single button. So it's like really simple, the button at the top, they click and the magic happen. And then this is the final thing that I wanted to mention that is dashboard widgets. These are two widgets inside the DHIS dashboard and it's actually the same thing. It's metadata sync, so it's something that we explore. We also have has a script that you can install in the server and use it. It was interesting, and now we are seeing that the, there are some challenges with like sharing information between the different applications and so on. And nothing else. This is the end. So, if you have any question, thank you, Adrian. Um, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, I think what you mentioned about the data store is is really key, and and what Birk mentioned earlier is is a very relevant to that in that it's it can be easy to uh, or it, it can be challenging to to manage a database especially when you your only tool really to manage that is in the browser right so you have to download a lot and then do your migration or maybe a partial update and then send it back across the network 
Um, and that's something I think uh, that and also uh, trying to manage schemas and versioning of schemas in the data store that we should uh, be thinking about. We should look at how to do that in a more native way to support uh, kind of more more robust and, and long lived uh, extensions using data store as their persistence layer. Uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, we have like a layer on top of data store where we are using TypeScript mm. so that we have some kind of typing in the data store. Mm -hmm. and obviously, it, everything is checked from the JavaScript side, but mm -hmm. this is a good way for us that to know that the values are actually what we are expecting in the app. So mm -hmm. while doing something like that. You, you did something similar, didn't you? Yeah, yeah I think we, we've played around with some things uh, similarly as well, but I think it's also important for us to think about it from the back end side as well. So being able to do some schema enforcement or uh, even backend migrations of data, for example, because that can be quite a, a data heavy operation to download a, a lot of data from the data store to migrate all of it and then push it back. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also runs into issues if you have multiple people using your application who and you need to make sure that only one of them is doing the migration at a time, for example. Um, so I think there's a lot uh, we can explore there. And builds, I don't know, uh, Kai, if you wanted to talk at all about multiple entry points, maybe. I could as well, yeah. Useful, I mean, like, yeah, we, with our kind of new plugin system that I think we talked a little bit about, <laughs> uh, it, it will be possible to build as many different plugins with as many different entry points um, as you like. And so hopefully that, if you're, if you're gonna use that kind of plugin system for, um, this this app that should be kind of facilitated by that kind of thing. And you should be able to kind of build those those different uh, builds for the kind of different clients and contexts. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that should be easier if you're using the platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's actually that something that we have been discussing. Like in some of our apps, we are integrating your apps and we are using this plugin mechanism that you have for data visualization. And we were discussing about having that mechanism also for capture for data provenance. Great. Thank you, Adrian. Any other questions or comments for Adrian? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, good morning. My good name morning. is Carlos from Mozambique. And first of all, congratulations for this application because metadata exchange between DHS2 instance is the day by day job of a DHS2 implementer. So my question is, uh, which which scenarios uh, this application is using for metadata exchange? A scenario where we have two DHS2 instance with the same package, mm -hmm. or a scenario where I can have uh, two DHS2 instance, but the package I'm exchanging, send it to, to the production are different. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the, the IDs. Mm -hmm. I can have, uh, for example, uh, an attribute mm -hmm. in production, let's say name with one ID, and in, in, in my test uh, server with a different ID. Mm -hmm. If the, this application can help making these uh, verifications yep. so I don't create duplications on my yeah, so uh, this is something that you can do from here. So if the metadata is identical, you don't need to anything. Well, the only thing is that you need to define your target distance, like the URL, the user credentials, and so on. If not, you have this mapping functionality that allows you to map to data element. Well, it, it allows you to map any metadata. Okay, so basically you will have on the left side the metadata on the origin, on the right side the metadata on the target distance. And there is an option that is called auto mapping that will try to do a best effort. So it will look for ID, code, and name. I will try to see if there is something that looks similar. So maybe the UID is different, but the code is the same or something like that. So it will generate the mapping automatically. If not, you can still do the mapping. Say like, okay, this question in, in my, this question, I mean, this data element in my origin is actually this data element in the destination. And this will be a story and when the synchronization is doing, we will apply that transformation to the data and to the metadata that is being generated. And this can be done almost for any piece of metadata. 
from data element, category option, even organization unit, because maybe you have like, and this is an actual case where in the field we have like an organization unit that goes until the health center, but in the headquarter is much simpler. So you can do like a mapping of organization units. So the data in this organization, you need to go to another organization unit in the destination. But it's also, uh, we also have like the possibility of moving data from tracker to aggregate. Because with this map, you can map program indicator into data element. And what you are actually doing is moving from tracker to aggregated data. So yeah, this supports. Yeah, and that's all stored in the data store. Sorry. The mapping is in the, in the data, in the data store. store. Yeah, and it's huge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think we want to probably move on. Towards... Yeah, and um, I would like to also know what's happening uh, in the back end or when this exchange is executed, actually. I Because I, I think, okay, for the new metadata, uh, this metadata is being created uh -huh. in the production instance. Correct. But for those metadata that are already exist in both instances, what is happening? Are we updating all the information or parts of it? No, both in the manual sync and the synchronization rule, you are going to select the metadata that you want to copy. Okay, so you are selecting actually sometimes it's like just this data set with all the dependencies. And then you even have the option of defining the strategy. It can be a merge strategy or a replace strategy. In terms of API, we are using the DHIS API, exporting the metadata, applying the transformation mapping that we need to do and importing. And actually you can define if you want to do it in synchronization mode or asynchronous mode. That is something that is supported by the API. If you go for asynchronous, you don't need to stay there. This is going to happen. And whenever you come back, you will see if it actually happened, if it was successful or a failure. I think, to be fair, I have to say vote for Metadata Sync and thank you, Adrian. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you all. We we have a kind of a rapid fire set of presentations today, but hopefully it's interesting to people. I I'm I'm actually quite surprised we're we're like standing room only in a room for developers. I thought we were going to have everyone leaving because we started talking about code. Uh, because they weren't expecting it. But yeah, really, really cool to see you all here. Uh, okay, Kai, you're up next, I suppose. Well, your your presentation is there. <laughs> or, or, or Eric, do you want to go first? Sorry. No, it's fine. <laughs> well, one of you. <laughs> okay, Eric's going to talk to us a little bit about the, the work to uh, add plugin entry points to the, the capture application, which is very, very exciting. There you go. All right. I trust everyone can hear me now online as well. Yeah. Finally, it's about time that we talk a bit more about the capture plugins. It's been uh, sprinkled a little bit around this uh, entire week, but we've never really gotten the chance to talk about it in detail. Um, you might also have heard that there are some HISP groups out there who actually started trying out uh, this technology. And no, this is not a secret club or anything. You're just... Uh, I just haven't gotten around to invite you yet. But now that one is here, we can fully support it and, uh, and we can start using it. So I'll, I'll share my screen, uh, but for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Eirik and I'm part of the core development team here at the university. Uh, I work on the Capture app daily uh, and I've been the one who have implemented the plugins so far that we have so far. So uh, first of all, what are capture plugins? And basically what are plugins in general? Uh, I'm not going to stand there and take all the... Oh. Okay, to be honest, I actually stole this presentation from Kai and he added the animations. I tried to remove it, but it didn't work, but uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll shamelessly blame him for the animations. <laughs> I just changed the text. Yeah. Exactly, exactly, yeah. 
No, what are plugins? Plugins are basically extension points that we put into our uh, core applications. So uh, previously, what you had to do if you went to, uh, and, and meant to do some custom logic or anything, you would have to fork every application and you would have to keep a separate track of, uh, of that. Once we added more functionality and more features, you would have to, to keep this up to date and, and it just turns into a mess eventually. Um, this is the capture plugins is part of a system-wide thing uh, and I'm building upon the great technology that both Kai and Tom in particular have built and it's, it's uh, platform-wide. Uh, but I'm I'm talking a bit more about the the capture specific things here. So uh, the the main thing is that you are now able to to add any business logic and UI changes into the capture app if you started using the capture app, uh, which you should, uh, and uh, UI things. And uh, and the best thing about it is that there's no forking needed. So there currently are two types of plugin in the capture app. And one of them, the first one I'll go through, is the form field plugins. See, animations work much better now. Yeah, so the form field plugins are plugins that you put directly into your forms. So every time you enter a, a data in the Capture app, you have these forms that you can see over here on the right-hand side. I tried to add a screenshot about it. Uh, and there is one value type up there that is uh, not part of the core functionality that we have in the Capture app, and that is the, the patient ID up here. And it says enter patient ID, and then you have a, a cool blue button that says search. This is one of the, the mock plugins that we created, and it's actually there to simulate some sort of civil registry where you try to, to call some external API to get some data. So they're injected directly into the form. We provide everything that you need to uh, build and develop your business logic. Um, you can see that we provide in metadata. Is this okay? Yeah. We, we pass in the metadata. We pass in any values in the form. We pass in the rules engine output, so you get the errors and warnings that you get in the field. Uh, and one thing to, to keep in mind here, uh, one thing that is very different from using plugins compared to custom forms is that the plugins actually only have, uh, they're running in the sandbox environment and they only have access to the fields that you provide it. So when you set up the, the plugin, you actually need to configure that this plugin needs to have access to this, this, and this. So it won't be able to change anything else. It won't be able to read data. It won't be able to send any data that is not pre-configured. Uh, some typical use cases for the form field plugins. Uh, doing external API calls was a big thing last year, and, and we really tried to tackle it um, using plugins. Uh, external API calls can be to, to fetch any, any outside data or, or even do some custom validation with some other systems. Uh, it's a lot of things. You can see the civil registries that I've, I've put up there is uh, also a very, very big thing. Uh, and, uh, and the last thing I'll mention is dependent fields, and there comes the, the ICD stuff, for example, is, is one of the big things. So there's not really a great way to do uh, to handle large option sets in, in the Capture App or Tracker Capture App right now. It just turns into a, a very big, long uh, list of options, and, uh, and dependent fields might be one of the things where plugins can really shine, where you first have to select one thing, and then based on that, you can select uh, another thing in the dropdown. We also do have enrollment plugins, and, uh, and Mike uh, displayed this to some extent, but I want to dig a bit more deeper into it. So enrollment plugins are plugins that we inject into the enrollment pages of the Capture App. So in the Capture App, if you're trying to, to edit an enrollment, then you get into this dashboard. I've tried to add the screenshot over there, but uh, the, the plugin took up most of the, the dashboard, but you've probably seen it. Um, they're usually displayed as widgets, but that's, of course, totally up to you. And some use cases for this is doing any custom validations and, of course, the, the growth chart, which is a thing that we're... Um, sort of releasing next to the, the 41 that you can start to pick up. That's the thing that I've uh, tried to, to display there in the screenshot where you, you're doing some sort of growth monitoring or nutrition program, then you can add this sort of extra extra validation and extra displaying of the, the charts, for example. And, and of course, all of this is up to you. One thing to do keep in mind though when it comes to the growth chart is that today and for today only, we actually have one of the developers who've built this, Henrik here, you can raise your hand. 
it's only here for a day, uh, but they've built this. And if you want to try this out and want to see how this works in your instance, please uh, feel free to talk to him. Uh, one of the other things that were pretty big during the COVID pandemic, for example, was vaccine registry lookup and, and having to do some sort of external API call to, to fetch which vaccines, for example, was, was made to a certain user. And I'm also brave enough to try to do a live demo. So um, there is one thing that I really want to show you, and that is how easy this really is to set up. Uh, and I'm going to take you through the entire thing from start to finish, and I'll hopefully do it in less than a minute. That is how is it is. So I'm in the capture app. You can see there's nothing nothing special about uh, anything here. There's no plugins installed or anything. Uh, let's see. So first thing I'll do is that I'll, I'll try to install the plugins itself. And plugins are deployable to the app hub so far. And down here, you can see the capture growth chart. So I'll first of all install that one. Then I want to do the civil registry. That is not on the app hub yet. There's a separate repository for it. You can build it and you can do the manual upload. And that's fine because I want to show you the manual upload as well. This is perhaps where you'll start. So if you have a, a DHS2 custom app and you run just the build functions, then you get this bundle that you can upload. So I'll upload that as well. And there is also one thing that I want to show you is that we built a uh, configurator app, tracker plugin configurator. We uh, one of the developers on the core team has no social life and way too much hands on time on his hands. That developer being me. So you can install this as well. Uh, you don't have to use this app, but it really does help with the configuration and everything. So I'll of course use that app. Uh, I'm a bit biased though, but um, there is documentation on how not to. So we use the data store to to map everything and configure everything. Uh, if you don't have that configured, the app will do it for you, create keys, and it will create everything that you need. I'll start off by configuring the form field plugin, and I'll select the context of where I want to display it. And I want to display for the person, tracked entity type, and the growth monitoring. Here you can see on the left-hand side, uh, it resembles the metadata that I've put into the maintenance app. So you define your form in the maintenance app, and then I can drag in any plugins that I want to. So I'll add the mock civil registry plugin, and you can see that there's a, a yellow warning label here saying that I haven't defined what it actually should uh, know. So I'll add the first name, uh, and this is the way that you set up the actual configuration. I'll also add the gender. And last, I'll add the date of birth. So all the things that the plugin itself needs to, to uh, know is the actual plugin alias here. It doesn't need to know the ID that's, uh, that's by purpose so that it's generic and can be installed on, on different systems. And this is a bit more technical. We can go a bit more into it, but this is basically how it's how it works. I've added these four things to the to the plugin. I also want to add the enrollment plugin and I want to add the growth chart itself. So I'll I'll do the growth monitoring program there as well. And for the enrollment dashboard or the enrollment overview, I want to um, do some configuration here. And I also want to add the capture growth chart. You can pretty much decide where you want it. I'll put it on the bottom here. I'll also show that this is uh, this is a good way to reorder things on the capture app in general. If even if you're not using plugins, so just to show you, I can I can change the profile widget and put it on top. For example, I think there's a... actually I'll put the enrollment widget over the profile widget. I think that's better. So I can save it. I can do it for the new event and edit event as well. I'll open up the capture app. Choose the growth monitoring program and add a new person in this org unit. And as you can see, there's a sudden new thing up here. If I write something like search, then you can see that it prefills. So, what this mock plugin does is that it fetches an API call, gets the data, and then prefills the forms, uh, the things that I've given it access to. So, you have the DOB, the first name, last name, and gender. And the possibilities are really endless here. You can do whatever you want. For the growth charts, I want to show you here. This is a pre-configured enrollment that I have. 
And this is the growth chart in action. So you can set up, for example, wait for age, zero to five years, and you can see that the plugin itself is rendered. It fetches the data that it's, uh, it's given access to, uh, and then it displays, displays it in the way that you want. So yeah, possibilities are really endless here. This is a much, much safer way of, uh, of extending our apps, and we really do hope that uh, you would pick up this and, and use it more. And if you are using it, I really want to, to be involved. It's... Uh, there's a lot of great use cases here. And as I said, I have way too much time on my hands. So, all right, any questions? Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. So I'm just interested to know, uh, especially on the form fields plugin, if it's possible to apply program rules to the to the fields. So program rules works exactly the same, and and as I said, we we give you the the um, rules engine output as well. So if you give it access to a field where it's sort of where you get the rules engine output, then you will also get it in the plugin. So you can use use everything. You can also, uh, if you need to bypass the rules engine, there is possibility to, for example, set an error on a field. Uh, if you don't want it to run through the rules engine, you can manually set an error and a warning on fields if you want to, to do it that way. Yeah. Everybody knows I like to run. This is exciting. <laughs> Thank you. Nice work, Eric. So my, my question is like, if I install a plugin, will it be for all the users? Uh, like, like I'm asking the context, for example, if a system is being used by public and private sector both and the private sector data flow is a bit different and they also want those differences appearing on the UI as well. Is it possible to do this for a certain set of user groups? In general, the answer is yes. Yeah, of course, the question comes in. You, you have to configure it uh, in a way so that it gracefully handles that, of course. But you can you can handle it because a plugin is just a DHS2 custom web app uh, and it's made in the same way. So permissions is made in the same way. So if you have a user role that you don't want to see this plugin, then you can just remove the access from it and, and it won't appear. But of course, you have to test it thoroughly so it works both with and without. Any other questions for Eric? Who here wants to make a capture for you? Nice. <laughs> Eric, what's your email? <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. And I'll just say that this is uh, this is also kind of indicative of the the way we're moving towards adding more extension points. So this, this, these are two new extension points. We have also applications. We have also dashboard plugins. Uh, but there are many more that we would like to, to to think about adding to the system so that you don't have to fork in order to make small changes to the system or customize the last the last twenty percent for your use case. Um, and we think that's that's a really powerful way to to enable developers to build and share innovations. It also makes it easier to maintain the thing that you build, right? Because the thing is smaller than an application, for example, which can be quite extensive or if you try to fork an application. Okay, uh, next up we have Kai, who I'm really excited about this presentation. Um, Kai is gonna talk to us a little bit kind of uh, under the hood of what we're, what we're doing in the app platform to move uh, from one technology to another. Um, the, the, the idea is that you shouldn't really notice this. So it's not really something that you need to, uh, well, there are a couple, a couple exceptions, but it's, it really should be something that's kind of uh, invisible to developers that are using the platform. But I think it's a really cool um, uh, technical uh, approach and, and so it's probably interesting to developers to see how we're doing this and, and why we're doing it as well. So over to you, Kai. Cool, thanks. Yeah, so what we're working on is a little bit of a tech upgrade to the app platform. 
Currently, we're using um, Create React app under the hood to kind of assemble everything in a platform app and get it running and run a development server and make production builds. But uh, we're moving to Vite, which is now kind of the newest standard of these uh, kind of front end build tools. And um, there are a couple reasons that, we'll, that we're doing that. And I'll kind of walk through a little bit of what it looks like, um, how what exactly we're using Create React App for now so that you get a sense of, what does that say? Yeah, OK. Um, what exactly is changing, why we're making this migration now, um, where we're at with the progress, uh, some new perks that we'll be getting. We'll be able to notice some positives, which should be cool and uh, hopefully exciting and make developer life kind of smooth. There will be some small changes and some things that will deprecate in, in the interest of kind of moving towards more modern standards. And I'll uh, kind of just touch on those. And as we're getting to the full release, we'll go into those in a lot more detail. Um, but then like uh, some other kind of exciting things coming after our current work now. So right now, when we build um, platform apps, what that kind of looks like is we take this uh, shell, which is kind of like a foundation of a Create React app, um, and make a copy of this shell into your local DHS2 app uh, directory. Then when you um, run the start script, a copy of your app gets transpiled into this shell. Uh, so these would be your kind of app files here, circled there. This is just like a really simple example app. And um, then the, the lower app.js there that the arrow is coming from imports whatever the content is exported from your app.js in the D2 app directory there. And so now your app is now in this complete Create React app structure. And from there, we can use the React scripts to run your app and uh, build everything. So this is kind of what we're what we're doing and what will be kind of changing up a little bit. The same pro uh, the same kind of process of this copying and kind of shellifying uh, your app is still the the strategy now, but we might upgrade that in the future. But we we'll be using Vite here instead of uh, React scripts. Why we're doing this migration? Uh, firstly, is that Create React app is no longer maintained, and that has you know that's really not the best practice to use older tools. We want to be uh, making sure that we're getting kind of uh, dependency upgrades and maintenance. Uh, sometimes uh, there will be like a security warning on old packages that are used by the tool, um, and we want that to get updated. Uh, we get kind of annoying Babel warnings in the console when we run our apps, and uh, there was, ooh, I think I just got disconnected from the Wi-Fi. Let me try to fix that really quick. Let's see. I don't think I can control the slides from here, so I'll just talk about it. There was a case where um, a dependency in Create React app broke, basically. And uh, that kind of filtered through to what we were using. Um, and so we got an unexpected breaking change in our platform. And it was not really possible for us because it's a dependency. That's not really something that's easy to, to fix unless we can change the kind of root package. And it's not really possible to get Create React App to publish a new change. So we had a problem with that. Um, Let's see. Yeah, let me use those for now because the Wi-Fi is struggling. Sorry about that. Cool. And how can I can uh, control it? Oh, I think I just connected. Um, yeah, just back a little bit. This is good. Thank you. Let me just see. I am reconnected now. So when I get to uh, showing some live stuff, 
maybe I can switch back over. So yeah, so that was a problem and we'd like to be, we'd like to have some more control over what is going on there. Next, we also have a lot of configuration options that were kind of boxed in to with this kind of uh, big opinionated tool um, using Vite. We'll have a lot more control over that. One example is that can, uh, Create React App has its own idea of what a service worker is, how it's created, how it's bundled. Um, and we have very different ideas about that. And so, for example, when we make our service worker, we, in our own code, we uh, run some things to undo some of the caching that Create React App wants to do. And so that's a little ugly and takes a lot of extra code to do that. Um, we also want to ma uh, make plugins. And so what this looks like for us is in addition to this kind of app entry point with a, an initial kind of HTML file and the structure to build an app out of, we also want to make other entry points and other kind of like uh, kind of like a multi-page app um, type structure, and we're not able to do that currently very well with Create React App. So we kind of have this duplicate Webpack script, which is the kind of build tool under the hood of Create React App, uh, that makes an entire new app. That's not very smooth, uh, and uh, yeah, not very useful to work with. So with uh, a V config, we can have control over those things. Other bonuses are it's faster. I think that's what's uh, going to stand out the most to developers using it. Um, and it has uh, modern features like better control over um, or better support for ES modules, which is uh, part of how it runs faster and starts up faster. Let's see. So I think that I will switch over to my screen now. Oh, but I think, am I still in the Zoom meeting? No, I'm not. <laughs> OK. While we're switching over, has anyone here used Vite before? One, two, three. Any, anyone used Create React app before? Mm -hmm. Seven, eight, nine. <laughs> yeah. If you use the platform, you use Create React App, technically. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe I'll just stick with this for now. Yeah. Sorry about that. Mm. Um. Yeah, now it's now it's Zoom that I'm struggling with. But um, I think I'll just kind of talk th through some things and then uh, describe what I would show you otherwise. So we've gone through here. Does this work? Excellent. Where we're at now. So this last week, we have um, set this up and released it on an alpha version of CLI app scripts. So it's available for testing if you want to try it out and see if it's working. Um, we just released it. So, you know, in uh, I expect to find some hiccups and quirks. I just found one yesterday. So I, maybe I can be the first to say that. So it handles uh, starting and building apps. And so you can even PWA app. So it'll build a service worker for you. You can try it out. Um, and I think, yeah, any um, app that I think, yeah, any app. But uh, we don't have it set up to handle plugins with Vite yet. That'll be the, kind of the next PR and the next step. Um, but it's pretty cool. I, one of the things that I wanted to show off was running it in another app, like the scheduler app, and it starts up in about five seconds, where it took about 20 before. And that's kind of a, a big difference for me that helps me kind of stay focused on what I'm doing. I think 10 seconds is kind of this threshold where um, if I'm working on something and have to wait for 10 seconds, I lose focus, and then I need to spend another like minute or so kind of getting back on what I'm doing. And so hopefully that'll be a big help to uh, developers. Um, and you're welcome to use it. Uh, it'd be cool to get your feedback on it if you're curious about trying it out. Some of the perks are that it is faster. It's, um, yeah, I don't know. It's really enjoyable to use. And I was working on, so I was talking to someone about, uh, um, they wanted to, 
uh, work on a library locally and see the changes in that library reflected in an app that was using it. And so just as a little test, I tried making a change in the, the node modules of an app and then restarting the, the development server. So not the entire start script, but just starting it over so that the, the new change from the node modules could be reflected in the app. And it took less than a second. And so that was, I don't know, really satisfying to see, whereas, you know, before that kind of thing would take stopping and restarting the entire development server process and would take 30 seconds or a minute. Um, so that was fun. Um, I added a new change where previously when you would use the, the app platform to start your server, it would be like, okay, it's ready on this port. Um, but I made a change so that you get the actual Vite interactive uh, CLI there. So you can do things like um, open up the console, show like uh, the, the like local, um, what do you call it? Like the address that you could use on your local area network to visit the app. You can restart the server, um, clear the console. You can see updates from when you're like making changes to files. You can see uh, like that the file was edited and has been hot reloaded. And it's just kind of useful and nice to use, I think. It looks good. There'll be another change. Um, Another big thing is that in the future, this will really enable some kind of like nice options like multiple plugin entry points, being able to, to have a, a, a complex app and have lots of different kind of sections or builds of it, um, all that share code between them. Um, and so you don't duplicate code between all of those builds. So those are some of the perks. A preview of some of the um, breaking changes and deprecations that'll come up because of this change are that uh, the minimum node version will increase. I'm guessing that most people are already on a high higher version like this. Um, Vite also has some opinions about uh, the file extensions that you use. And they say that this is for performance reasons. And basically, they don't want to parse like a vanilla JavaScript file for JSX syntax, because the JSX syntax parser is kind of resource consuming and slow to run. So by default, they will not parse JS files for JSX and will throw an error if you, if you have like a React component in a, a .js extension file. I've added some configuration to at least let that happen. And so you can, you can add this new change to your app and run it and see everything without making any changes at all, which is cool. Um, but the limitation is on hot reloading of those components. And so you'll want to migrate to .jsx extensions for, uh, or .tsx extensions for uh, components with JSX in them. We're working on um, just finding the right script to make that migration really easy. We are not the first people to run into this problem. A lot of people are migrating to Vite and run into this exact thing. So I suspect that that'll be a pretty solved problem already. We're changing up how environment variables are used, uh, moving to a more modern format instead of app, which is kind of what we need for create React app. Uh, the environment variables will go on to import.meta.env. Um, and so you can migrate to this new format. And so it should be a little bit shorter. Um, and for the rare case where people have custom index.html files, there will be some uh, some changes that you should be aware of there. <clears throat> and in the future, what we have going on is we'll be we'll be building plugins with this. So for people using plugins, that should be faster and smoother. Um, we can build libraries with it. Um, if we do that, we'll um, actually not quite after building libraries. Uh, we can replace our Babel config that we currently have. We want to come up with a new way of kind of handling the, the shell so we can package your app into this kind of Vite structure um, with all the kind of like HTML and icons and other uh, app shell things while keeping your files in the exact same place, which kind of helps with debugging and file system serving things uh, while you're running the app. We're considering using vTest, which is like, an, you know, made by the same team as Vite to handle the unit tests instead of Jest. If we do that, that'll save us a lot of configuration. It can be faster and supports ES modules better. Um, and we're also thinking about, and I don't necessarily want to promise this, but I think 
I aspire to it at least, which is being able to uh, uh, have the consumers of the app platform be able to to extend the Veet configuration for for a bit. So that might be like um, if you have this library that you're working on locally, you can you can kind of force Veet to serve that file for you instead of just assuming that it's a dependency and and won't be changed um, or for handling flow type checking or other things or other kind of extension points that you want for your app. So I think it's pretty exciting. I, I really like how it's shaping up and kind of how it is cleaning up the platform a lot. And I think people will like having it be faster and kind of smoother to use. Um, so that's what I have to present for you today. Hope you get to see it soon and uh, enjoy it. Thank you, Guy. Any questions about it? There was one question. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, on my side, uh, I have already been using uh, VGS for some projects, but I would like uh, uh, to know something. Uh, I found uh, a BangJS, it is uh, like a hard time, and uh, it's... I'm sorry, yeah, I can't hear. Okay, okay. Uh, so, I was saying that uh, I am already using uh, VGS nice. for many of our projects. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, I found uh, also uh, another tool, and it is a uh, runtime uh, compiler and uh, all those things, to stuff. Uh, its, its name is BangJS. One, yeah. Yeah, one. So uh, it is more. It is. Uh, I find that it is very faster. A uh, faster like than a uh, uh, Node.js, uh, for mm -hmm. example, and uh, the compilation is very quick. So I try to create uh, many uh, some projects with uh, with 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 it, in the, and I find that it is very cool. Mm -hmm. So for Gashes two projects, I try that. I, I try the creation better. Also, uh, as every 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 time I try it. That also a uh, that fails, and uh, I got uh, some specific uh, uh, error message that uh, there is uh, some specific checking related to yarn dot log file. So that means uh, so I would like to know if there is uh, maybe some uh, some controls based on specific using usage of uh, yarn dot log or yarn uh, uh, maybe yarn for for example. And uh, yeah. if uh, this migration is okay now, can we still use in uh, maybe VitJS or uh, BAN, for example, or we should also always uh, still use in uh, a YARN, for example? I would like to know. Yeah. Good question. Uh, maybe Austin can fill in the answer after my uh, limited knowledge. But there is, I do remember that in our kind of uh, assembling the kind of full DHIS2 app, we do run a check on the yarn.lock file. And I had, it, yeah, that's unfortunate. That's kind of like blocking your work. So you're using bun to compile and like manage the app. Okay. But not using, okay, yeah. Just, just, just as mainly as package management or as uh, also as compiling and bundling? Compilation, yeah, it's hmm. hard to know exactly what could be going on, um, because you're not you're not fully using the CLI app scripts library, is that right? But maybe like the app shell and uh, those start scripts, but. Um, yeah, it's hard to know exactly what's going on, but uh, feel free to get in touch. We can find like some details. Maybe there's a way to kind of um, make how the yarn.lock file is, uh, is managed. We can make that a little more flexible so that it's maybe not like a requirement. I'm not sure. Do you know if it's um, kind of okay to not use yarn in the the platform? Yeah, the, way, the way we do it now, we use yarn to do the installation for the shell that the in d that d two dot shell, and so that that will use yarn. Um, it should be possible so long as you have it in package.json and it's you can find it in node modules. So npm should also work. 
um, but the, it might be something to look into to whether we can support uh, other package management solutions as well. And also maybe if we're moving away from copying files into uh, into that D2 shell directory, that might be quite possible. Okay. There are some checks that we have in the platform itself when you run build or start that it will check for certain thing or ch check for version compatibility in or duplicate actually in, in the yarn.lock file that you can uh, avoid if you don't if you don't want it you can ignore those warnings um so that might might be something else that could be blocking that yeah. there is a, there's a way to to turn that off that's what i was wondering if that might throw and then like yeah maybe it requires the presence of the file but yeah thanks for bringing that up um yeah my name's oh i don't have my name tag my name's kai you can feel free to message me and we can try to figure something out yeah. and i think this is a good example but other people if you have issues that you run into if you share a like a, a a github repository or something that that has that issue it's it's a lot easier for us to to help to to debug that i'd be really curious to see how you're using bun as well because i've heard a lot about it same that's cool yeah yeah we do want the stuff to work for you so <laughs> that's our mission um let's see how are we on time it's 12. it's 12. i um, can i'm happy to answer questions uh if anyone wants to come up um during lunchtime yeah kai will be around thank you kai uh renee i think had a poll i'm so sorry we we didn't have chance to get the 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 closing today it's all right uh, i i do i do want to share one qr ahead, code ahead. for everyone um right. because um every time during the developer meetup i allow everyone to receive a badge and a community of practice. And this is always shared in a link on Zoom. Uh, I have shared this on Zoom right now, uh, but you should be able to also scan this QR code, log in with your COP account and click accept, and you will get a badge that you can show up on your profile. Um, and this stacks, so the more you gather, like it's it's like Pokemon. Um, it's the, the more you get, the better it is. Um, and I also want to invite everyone to join future meetups to um, the, it's every second Thursday of the month at this at this time slot. Uh, it starts like 11 instead of 1030, but the rest is the same. And that's uh, that's my summarized version. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Kai. Um, we, I, everyone should join the meetup next month and we'll have uh, we'll have a bit more kind of opportunity for giving some feedback as well. It's great. Okay, thank you all very much for being here. And uh, yeah.